Last week, I published a video where I talked about how the average person's resting heart rate is already in the category of increased risk of all-cause mortality and cardiovascular disease mortality. The average person's resting heart rate is between 60 and 100. And in a 2016 meta-analysis of 1.2 million people, every 10 beat increase beyond 45 beats per minute was linked to a 9% higher relative risk of all-cause mortality and 8% higher relative risk of cardiovascular disease mortality. So a resting heart rate of 60 to 100 would entail a 12 to 45 percent higher risk of mortality. This made a lot of people upset and worried because they found themselves in the increased risk category. First of all, having a resting heart rate of 60 is only a 12 percent increase in relative risk compared to a resting heart rate of 45, which isn't that much, but it's still not optimal. A resting heart rate of 105 would be a 55 percent higher risk, which would be quite concerning. Second of all, there's a reason why the average person has a higher resting heart rate. They're unhealthier and usually overweight. Even people who are generally considered not unhealthy tend to carry a few extra kilograms of excess body fat. They might not be obese, but they're definitely not athletes. Healthier and fitter people, on the other hand, usually have a lower resting heart rate because they're leaner with less body fat and they exercise regularly. This raises an important topic that I want to cover in this video, namely the difference between having a normal reference range for whatever biomarker and what's optimal. I'm going to give you a lot of examples where normal isn't optimal and it actually is linked to a higher mortality risk. Let's start by explaining what's the difference between normal and optimal. When we're talking about blood tests, resting heart rate, VO2 max and other biomarkers, then there is the quote-unquote normal reference range that is supposed to reflect where 95% of the normal population falls into. Sometimes the optimal range for the lowest risk of all-cause mortality is inside the reference range, or it's a part of the reference range. But it's almost never the entire reference range. What's optimal is usually a narrower window inside the bigger reference range. Let's take resting heart rate again. A resting heart rate of 60 to 100 is considered quote-unquote normal because that's where the majority of people's resting heart rate falls into. This 2020 study on over 92,000 people illustrated it perfectly. As you can see in the graph, the vast majority of people have a resting heart rate of 60 to 70, and only a fraction of the population has a resting heart rate below 50, which is the lowest risk group. So there is the normal reference range where 95% of people fall into, and then there is the optimal range that a smaller fraction of people fall into. And obviously if you look at the general population and then the vast majority of the average people aren't what you would consider as reflective of lowest all-cause mortality risk. The average person isn't that healthy and they have a higher risk of mortality and higher risk of chronic diseases than someone who is super healthy and super fit. That's why there's a difference between the reference range and the optimal range. You can find it in people as well. A great example of this are centenarians, the people who live over the age of 100. Centenarians in a lot of cases show very good biomarkers and blood work. Their epigenetic age tests show that centenarians and their offspring have a much lower biological age than controls. The centenarians are not only within the normal reference range for most of the biomarkers, but they're also in the optimal range. Or at least they were so when they were younger. Let's take a look at the oldest living man in history, Jeroman Kimura from Japan, who died at the age of 116. Jeroman avoided all chronic diseases like diabetes and heart disease his entire life until the age of 111, when he got chronic kidney disease. At 115, he was in the hospital for heart failure three times in his last six months of life before he died. They did a study on Jeroman and found that his blood work, even at the age of 111, when he got kidney disease, was pretty near optimal. His cystatin C was elevated due to the kidney disease, but his fasting blood sugar and cholesterol levels were all in the low risk category. As you can see from the graph, Jeroman's resting heart rate was 66 and his blood pressure was very high when he developed kidney disease, but it dropped to 49 a year after that and his blood pressure also normalized. Now, centenarians have very good genes, which is why they live so long and which is why they don't develop a lot of the chronic diseases, at least not that early. Being the offspring of a centenarian has been found to reduce your risk of stroke by 83%, diabetes by 86%, myocardial infarction by 78% and overall death by 81% compared to age-matched controls. For these people, it's their genetics that improves their blood markers, which then also slows down their biological aging and also reduces the risk of these chronic diseases. If you don't have centenarian parents or grandparents, then for you, the greatest likelihood of you becoming a centenarian is for you to
to try to optimize your biomarkers, your other fitness markers and blood work for as long as possible so that you would avoid a lot of the chronic diseases that kill most people. Let me give you an example of a biomarker where there's a huge difference between normal and optimal. Triglycerides are fatty acids in the blood that are used for energy. Too high triglyceride levels are causally implicated in diabetes and metabolic syndrome. They're also the outcome of diabetes as the body doesn't burn the triglycerides for fuel and they end up accumulating in the blood. Most labs use the reference range of 150 mg per deciliter as the cutoff point for normal triglycerides. However, it's found that higher triglycerides, even below the 150 mg per deciliter level, which is considered normal, are associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Triglyceride levels above 50 mg per deciliter are linked to a greater risk of cardiovascular disease in a linear fashion until above 200 mg per deciliter. Every doubling of triglycerides above 50 mg per deciliter increases the risk of cardiovascular disease by 65% compared to triglycerides below 50 mg per deciliter. So the reference range for triglycerides is 150 mg per deciliter, but anything above 50 mg per deciliter already increases the risk of heart disease. This actually sounds pretty disturbing because if you think that you're safe with a triglyceride level of you know 120 or 130, then you're wrong. Having anything above 50 is already linked to a higher risk, even though anything below 150 is considered considered normal. The reason the reference range is 150 is because most people's triglyceride levels are around 100 to 200. Most people have poor metabolic health and poor blood sugar levels, which increases their triglyceride levels. And this is why they're also at a higher risk of heart disease than someone who has a triglyceride level of 50. You know I talk a lot about the longevity benefits of the sauna on this channel. Using the sauna over 4 times a week compared to 2-3 to three times is linked with a 63% lower risk of heart disease mortality, 46% lower risk of hypertension, and 40% reduced all-cause mortality. It's also linked to a 65% lower risk of dementia and Alzheimer's. Those are quite incredible numbers. In my opinion, using the sauna is the second most powerful thing after exercise for your longevity. The sauna actually mimics a lot of the benefits of exercise by giving you a mild cardiovascular workout, increasing body temperature, as well as making you excrete out microplastics, xenoestrogens, heavy metals, and the so-called forever chemicals. I'm from Estonia, so there's a lot of saunas everywhere. However, they're not that common in the US or UK. Fortunately, infrared sauna blankets are about 10 times cheaper than a regular sauna, and they give the same benefits in terms of sweating and the heat. I'm using the Bond Charge infrared sauna blanket almost every day. It heats up in less than 5 minutes to 70 degrees Celsius, which is the temperature used in studies, and it fits under my bed. The Bond Charge blankets are also low in EMF, so you're not exposed to any radiation. You can get a 15% discount by heading to bondcharge.com for seamlund and by using the code seam. Alright, back to the video. Let's take another example of inflammation, which is mostly assessed by looking at your highly sensitive C-reactive protein or HSCRP. Normal CRP levels are 0.1 to 3.0 milligrams per liter. A HSCRP value of less than 1 milligram per liter is considered low risk for heart disease. 1 to 3 milligrams per liter is moderate risk, and anything above 3 milligrams per liter is high risk. However, as with triglycerides, the higher the CRP even inside the reference range, the higher the risk of heart disease. A 2020 dose-response meta-analysis found that compared to low CRP, less than 1 mg per liter, high CRP over 3 mg per liter increased the relative risk of all-cause mortality by 75%, cardiovascular disease mortality by 102%, and cancer mortality by 32%. So that's outside the reference range, which isn't surprising. However, a CRP of 1 to 3 mg per deciliter, which is inside the reference range, already was linked to a 30% higher risk of all-cause mortality and 43% higher higher risk of cardiovascular disease mortality compared to a CRP of below 1 mg per liter. So in this study, anything above 1 mg per liter was already linked to increased risk. There are several other studies that have looked at what's the actual CRP range linked to the lowest risk of all-cause mortality, and they all find that the lower the CRP, the lower the risk. A CRP of below 0.2 mg per liter is the lowest I've found to be linked to the lowest risk of mortality. So this is an even bigger difference than with triglycerides. The normal reference range for CRP is 0.1 to 3.0 mg per liter but anything above 1 mg per liter already increases the risk of heart disease and mortality quite a lot. And you would want to keep your CRP as low as possible, 
close to 0.2 and below that. Again, the average person's CRP levels are usually around 1 to 3 milligrams per liter, which is already linked to a higher risk compared to below 1 milligram per liter. I think you're starting to get the point. You can find this same phenomenon across virtually all other biomarkers. There's the reference range and there's the optimal range linked to the lowest risk of mortality and lowest risk of heart disease. Is it something that you have to be super concerned about? Like, do you always need to be in the optimal range for whatever biomarker? Depends on the biomarker marker and depends on your other biomarkers. No single biomarker is like superior to everything else. You have to look at all the other biomarkers together. When we're talking about triglycerides and CRP, then yes, you would want to get those pretty much as low as possible. With some other less conventional biomarkers like certain blood cells, there's less data about what's optimal and the optimal range might overlap with the reference range. One thing is for sure, no one has 100% perfect biomarkers. Even myself, who is in the best shape and health of my life in terms of blood work and fitness, got a score of 97 out of 100 on my last blood work. So it's obviously a very good result, it's better than most people's results, but there are still like a few individual markers that need to be optimized. And they might change over time, like there are certain situations where your blood work might go out of the you know, optimal range, but it doesn't necessarily increase your risk in the long run. Even the hardest biohackers and the longest living centenarians have some biomarkers that are not in the optimal zone. They might even be outside of the normal reference range. However, most of their markers are still close to the optimal. However, if you don't have very good longevity genetics, you don't have a lot of centenarians or any centenarians in your family, then the greatest likelihood of you living a long life is you trying to optimize your blood work and trying to improve them. I don't have that much time to go into all the details of how do you achieve that, not to mention all the optimal ranges for all the blood work, but you can check out my other video where I outline my full evidence-based longevity routine. Check out the link in the description. Other than that, thanks for watching this video. Make sure you click a like, subscribe, notification bell as well. My name is Seem. Stay optimized, stay empowered.